Welcome to the Highly Sensitive Person Podcast, a twice monthly podcast for people who experience the world intensely. Join me on a journey of acceptance of our highly sensitive person traits. Welcome to episode 60 of the HSP Podcast. I'm your host, Kelly. This is a show where I talk about what it's like to have sensory processing sensitivity. I share stories and opinions and sometimes interviews. And today is one of those days I'm very excited to share with you a special guest. He is a highly sensitive, extroverted man. This is Johnny Martinez, one of the hosts of the great podcast called the Introvert Extrovert Podcast. His show aims to help people better understand themselves. Johnny is, as I mentioned, a highly sensitive extrovert, and his co-host Al is an introvert who does not have the trait of high sensitivity. You can find their show at introextropod.com. I was really looking forward to speaking with Johnny and hearing his unique perspective as an extrovert and as a man who is highly sensitive. Johnny is also a comedian and a software engineer. So we talk about all of these things and what he finds are his challenges of his sensitivity, the benefits of his sensitivity, some funny stories, and ways that he copes. So without further ado, let's get started. Johnny, thanks so much for being on the show today. Kelly, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to do this. First thing I want to ask you is, how did you discover that you were highly sensitive and an extrovert? Ah, uh, well, that's a deep question. In the past, it was a long, you know, it's a long road. We all have these long life journeys and everything. And at some point, uh, like a lot of people, I was dealing with a lot of issues, uh, dealt with like health issues, and I started dealing with, you know, anxiety and depression issues and stuff like that. Uh, thankfully, now we have the internet, and I started kind of looking around and trying to do some research and things, and I started kind of piling up on books and this and that. And there was some point uh, when I found something mentioning something called uh, being a highly sensitive person. And I remember reading that and thinking, well, that's kind of a general uh, thing. You know, it's kind of like, Mm -hmm. it's like if they had named it something very uh, specific or science sounding like intercellular Mm -hmm. mitochondrial dysconexia or something, (laughs) maybe I would have taken it more serious, but I saw that and it was more, it's just like, pain hurt real bad syndrome or something like that. <laughs> and so I was turned on eventually to uh, Elaine Aaron's Dr. Dr. Ant's book and The Highly Sensitive Person. And I remember reading it and going like, okay, this is really me. And I started looking at the different uh, facets of it. But what I found was that it dealt more with the introvert side of things. And it kind of uh, described my brother more. And he's very introverted very highly sensitive. And for me, you know, if I go back looking at myself, I was always, I always kind of knew that there was something different about me. I kind of processed things differently. Um, when I was young, I, I was always really gifted, creative, and I had this crazy imagination. But I also knew that what I was describing, a lot of people typically weren't on the same frequency as me. They didn't get it until they actually showed them in another way. And um, I always figured that something was different about me, but I didn't know what it was. And I thought, okay, maybe I'm slightly autistic. Maybe I'm this, maybe I'm that. You know, my brother was autistic. And um, yeah, and then once I started reading about this, and then the key point here is that I read, okay, there, it's not just introverts. There's 30% or so of the highly sensitive people are actually extroverts. Mm -hmm. And the uh, male and female split is something like Mm 50-50. And then the more I got into it, the more I started researching it, the more I went, okay, this is me. And I realized, okay, my whole life, like a lot of people, if you realize there's something different about you, you're kind of trying to put the pieces together so that you can kind of complete the puzzle. And once you kind of complete the puzzle, you have a big picture of it. And then you can you can start to look at it as a gift and not as a hindrance. And once you know it as, as that, you can point yourself in the right direction so you can start to u- utilize it you know, wisely. It's like if you had a hammer but you until you realize that it's a hammer and start hammering nails if you're using it to saw wood it's not going to work and so you kind of need to kind of figure out what you have so that you can apply it in the right right way and i think that was a big thing for me and i think a lot of people that kind of get turned on to this stuff uh it really helps them because they they can start to do research and stuff that's not obvious about themselves they can they can start to you know put themselves in the right direction protect themselves a little better and um 
yeah, you use the gifts they have for the right reason. Hmm. I love that hammer analogy. I've never heard that before. Thank you. I, my brain came up with it while I was saying it. So really, you've never used that before? No. <laughs> No. Yeah, no, I that was, but yeah, I agree. It was pretty good. And feel free to substitute any tool or any trade. When you were learning about high sensitivity, what were the things that really stood out to you? Like, wow, that's me. The general thing was high, highly sensitive, and I always kind of knew that. But as as an extrovert, I, I'm so much different uh, in terms of the way I react being a highly sensitive person than introverts. And what I didn't connect with was the fact that they said the, the tendency is to kind of withdraw, right? You, you, things get overwhelming, you withdraw. Mm -hmm. And for me, as an extrovert, my tendency, my impulse is different than an introvert. It's like to, to control the situation outwardly and to uh, kind of like speak up and try to use, use my thinking on my feet and everything to do it. But sometimes I just noticed it was overwhelming for me and I would, I would, I would eventually withdraw, but that was kind of depressing for me. The general things that I saw that I, uh, that I connected with was the insomnia, uh, laying awake at night because I cannot be able to shut my brain off. And, and my mom's the same way. She's highly sensitive. Uh, the bright lights, all the, like the cliche ones, the, the bright lights, the, the not being able to sleep, the anxiety and the depression, the, um, the loud noises. I'm always trying to turn the radio down in cars and everybody wants it really loud. Um, yeah. And a lot of people identify with that. The things like, you know, you're at your job and there's the, the lights up above and you just wish that they were lower, but you can't tell people that because they think something's wrong with you. Right. And so, yeah. And then the, the other things that were just in general was the, uh, the, the high creativity and um, sometimes high intelligence, you know, I, was when I was young, I was uh, always in the gifted class, and I was always doing well. Even though I I hated school, and I didn't um, so by high school I stopped going as much as I should. Uh, th th school was always kind of easy for me, and then I was always very very creative and clever. Not in the, you know, my art form was never uh, the traditional ones like pen to paper or um, uh, painting on canvas or anything like that. It was more it being, being an engineer myself, it was always electronics and building stuff. And so, mm. um, there were signs of that early on. And then, like I said, I, I had stomach issues and everything and worried about stuff and, and yeah. So do you feel like today that you get to have those creative outlets? Yeah. And yeah, I, I do. And so what it's been, and I think a lot of people as, as we get older, we we're on this, this journey. And so we all have our own issues some have more than others, and we're trying to figure things out. W one of the, the most beautiful things in life is when we find somewhere where we can belong or we find a way, uh, if we have something inside of us, creative muscle that needs to be exercised, and we find a way to finally exercise that muscle, it can be great. And for me, I had two things. And the first one was electronics. And, you know, it, it was, I knew that, that that was good for me, but I also had this, this something else in me, which you know, th there's different things. It's like, why are we highly sensitive? I don't necessarily know. And our personalities are kind of a, uh, f a product of a bunch of different things. It's so complex. And so I had this thing where even though I built something, I enjoyed it being creative, but I needed to show it off to people. And I was also very funny when I was young. And so, <laughs> yeah. And so I found that uh, getting on stage and doing comedy was mm -hmm. the greatest feeling uh, in the world for me when it went well. And so the the problem for me was doing doing comedy was it took me something like five or six years to actually get on stage. And that's the the highly sensitive part of it. Getting on stage, the first time I got on stage, I had like an anxiety attack right before. And it took me years to get to that point. I had my material, I was ready to go. I just couldn't do it. And so mm -hmm. once I got on stage, um, it went really, really, really well. And... Um, the first time, you yeah. The first, well time. the first time, that's great. Yeah, it was in a it was in a cafe, and um, there was probably like ten comedians in the front area there, listening. And I, my only goal was just to make them laugh and to not make a fool of myself. Mm -hmm. And the first joke I told had three parts, and the first two parts of it bombed, and I bailed on the third part. Oh no! Yeah, and but it worked out because the bailing got a laugh, and then after that, I was okay, and then the rest <laughs> went really well. Once you uh, got that first laugh, maybe you kind of relaxed a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And so yeah. I, I felt that, you know, being, we all have, be, being a highly sensitive male is mm -hmm. is tough because we're not supposed to. You know, I come from a big, my dad's family is a big family. There were people in jail. There were people 
there were a lot of them were fighters. My grandpa was a fighter. My dad was a fighter. My uncle was a fighter. I am take after my mom. I'm sensitive and I'm small. I'm six foot tall, but I'm still small. And so I was supposed to be tough. And I had to cover that up with tr- faking to be tough for years. But I think that being funny was never a skill. It was always a defense mechanism. Uh, and, um, you know, be, be, I found that um, it was a way for me to deal with all these things inside. And, and so being highly sensitive was something that, which I think a lot of people do, which is, as a male, you have to cover it up. And mm-hmm. so what you end up doing is having a wound or something. It can be seen that way. And so what you do is you cover it up with these different kinds of Band-Aids and what happens later on in life is you don't realize till later on that as you look at it, you go, okay, I wonder what's beneath all these band-aids. And as you start to uh, turn inward and look inside on yourself, you take these band-aids off and that wound is still there. It's then when you can start to deal with it, accept yourself and grow. And so for me, uh, doing comedy was a, a place for me to do that. So were you implying that being a comedian or just being funny when you were young was kind of your way of making up for not being tough, like not being a sort of guy who wanted to fight? You're like, oh, you're the funny guy instead. So when you discovered being highly sensitive and you're talking about these Band-Aids and these wounds from the past and kind of trying to hide your sensitivity because that just wasn't, you know, your surroundings or your family wasn't really into that. How was that for you realizing that, wow, you are sensitive and that it's okay and that maybe you can try to accept it and embrace it. How was that realization and that process for you? It was a it was a lonely one because, <laughs> which I think is true for a lot of people, unfortunately, but being highly sensitive is something that's um, hard to put a finger on. It's hard to define. Sometimes it's it's still a little gray and it's also a spectrum, like being an introvert or being an extrovert is a spectrum. And some of us are more sensitive than others, and and yeah. So when I learned about it, the first thing was okay. I can I can read about it and everything, but I don't know who to tell and talk to about this because I at that time I was not seeing a therapist, and I had in the past, and and I had been uh, doing this and that. You know, I had so many emotions inside, and they were therapists were covering them up with medication. I didn't like it. I wanted to figure out who I really was and I wanted to I wanted to embrace it because I always knew from a young age I think a lot of HSPs know this is that there's something different about you and um, instead of the, the we have two options we can we can shut it off and we can ignore it and that's what a lot of us do with different different coping mechanisms mine was maybe this uh, like you talked about like being funny and being like charismatic and, and popular and everything in school uh, and, and ignoring all these emotions or we can embrace it and figure out and, and at some point we have to kind of put the pieces together to, to to be who we are. And so what I did was when I read that, I was ready at that point to kind of accept who I was and, and start to learn about myself. And so that's when I first kind of started taking off those band-aids that I had built up over the years and uh, started to look at it and try to heal it in a healthy way. And so unfortunately for me, I couldn't go to my parents because uh, my dad is the opposite of sensitive. <laughs> he's he's very he's empathetic, but he can't. You know, you tell him that, and and you know, part of being highly sensitive is a is a strong intuition, I think, and an awareness. Like I'm, mm-hmm. I've always been hyper aware of what's going on around me uh, to the point of I can't. That was another thing that I've uh, identified with was I can't get other people's emotions out of me. It's I feel whatever the room feels, yeah. and I have a need as an extrovert instead of withdrawing. What I do is I try to fix the room. Mm. Uh, to my own uh, sacrifice. And so that mm-hmm. plays a role and in, in, in stresses you. And so um, what I did was I said, okay, what can I do? What I, I need to understand this because if I'm going to push forward in my life and do the things I want to do, this is going to be there and it'll help me. Like when I read, like the first time I read my, like a Myers-Briggs personality test, it really helped me understand myself. Mm-hmm. And so I said, okay, being an extroverted, highly sensitive person is something where I have strong intuition, and I read that you—it's—it's—it's it's, it's a blessing in that um, the empathy that you have and the intuition that you have, you need to kind of find a cause, and kind of you're a good leader for that cause, and that's kind of where you're good. And I, and I realized, okay, that's good, that's good, and that's one of the reasons that we started uh, our podcast is because the whole thing of helping people understand themselves and and that I was able to uh, listen to people's issues and uh, you know when I was young I would listen to them and then 
it was just interesting to me, for me to talk about it. But as I got older and got a better uh, intuition for for life and, and and more experience in life, I was able to help people really well. And said, okay, bingo, I got something that I can do, and um, and and uh, I got more of a clear path in life to instead of just like constantly having these. Uh, this bubbling up of emotions inside of me that I didn't want to deal with and I'd cover up with various things. And so that's kind of what it was is, is let's look inward in myself, deal with it, um, and then push forward with the right path. So you decided not really to tell your parents. I, I tried talking to my mom and it was funny because she went, yeah, <laughs> and that was it. And so that's right. with my mom. That means, oh, Johnny. Yeah. And so, yeah. And so then I just yeah. kind of moved on. I get that. I mean, I've never really talked about it in depth with my parents. They, I mean, they know I have this blog and this podcast and stuff, but we've never like talked about it. Yeah. A little, I, a little bit. In seventh grade, to, to give you an idea of my parents, in seventh grade, I was quarterback and flying football. My dad was the coach. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I'm not somebody who's meant to play football. And <laughs> uh, we were yet to find that out. And so then I remember at one point, I, I, tried to catch an interception on defense and the ball came in and, and just like shattered my finger and, and uh, yeah I, it was broken really bad and to this day it's like my left my left uh, index finger is much shorter than my right and I just was crying and mm-hmm. and my my finger was clearly broken and my dad just his response was uh stay in the game uh you sissy and so I had to finish oh, the game no. playing quarterback and he didn't say sissy and then um <laughs> The x-rays came back and the doctor said, you have a really bad break. And I would just be like, see, see. And there, there was no response. So that's just wow. kind of the way, the way it was. And so, of course, of course, in that environment, then you have to figure it out. You know, I'm lucky I have two great sisters and I can talk to them about stuff because we both grew up uh, with the same parents. And so they're a lot older than me. And so then they can be a mentor and kind of I can see they're a little farther along the path. So I can kind of see their track and see what they've dealt with. And it helps me a lot. Wow. Well, thank you for sharing that story. Hearing that really helps illustrate in my mind how difficult it must have been for you as a sensitive boy and teen and young man to have a father figure like that who was so drastically different from you. So I'd like to talk more about the comedian aspect of your personality. And we already talked about how you were always kind of a funny guy, even as a kid. How did you decide to go on stage and become a comedian? And how do you think your sensitivity plays a role? First off, it took me uh, years to get on stage. I, I, um, what I say about it is the real comedians, because there's people, there's different types of comedians. There's like the, the, like the business comedian where he's just doing it after work and he's very, uh, I I feel like he's not a real sensitive person and not a real Mm -hmm. comedian. But then there's these, the real comedians, the sensitive ones that I meet are all twisted and have something off about them. And and there's something sweet and beautiful about it that that little that little tweak is almost like an itch that they that they constantly have, like in the back of their neck. And getting on stage is the only way to scratch it. And that's the only way I can describe it is that I don't think you choose to be a comedian. It chooses you. Yeah. Uh, for whatever reason, your environment, your personality, what you grew up with, your genetics, maybe, I don't know. But you get to a certain point and you have the comic timing and you have something that you can, is, uh, it's just in you. And so, you know, I, some people like their their life is, is making up for a hole in their heart, maybe from a parent not being there, uh, some weird experience in life. Like I know the way my parents were. And I know that when I was young, I was always trying to make my mom laugh because I didn't get... Uh, maybe as much attention as I wanted to from her, and so I might have developed this, and 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 then my my uh, I w- my dad uh, had like a youth group with like high school kids all like, and so I was like eight years old hanging out with high school kids all the time, and I wanted to fit in, so I realized that I could be pretty funny, and that was a way that got them to like me, and so I think it just kind of developed, and so I had this this thing where. When I would watch comedy, not only did I, I absolutely adore comedy, and I grew up, I'd come, I'd get home from school as in elementary school, and I'd immediately turn on Comedy Central, mm-hmm. and watch stand up for a while, and then I'd go, I'd go ride my bike or my skateboard, or whatever. But at, at first, that's what I would do, and I don't know. At some point, I just realized like, like there was this itch that needed to be scratched in me, and I would watch comedy, and I would see those guys, and it would be the the greatest fantasy in the world for me to be getting laughs on a stage, and um. 
being an extrovert, being somebody who uh, admittedly has this almost like in a shameful way, like a, a need for attention. I, <laughs> I, uh, and as I get older, that's less and less because as I, I learn more about myself, I, that, that hole is not there as much, you know? Um, and so I just, one day I had to, I had to do it. And so I said, all right, screw this. I'm going to take all the material I have. I'm going to work on it for like a couple of weeks. And we're going to get on, get on stage. And, um, I, the host kind of, I, I met him and I said, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to get on. And it went really well. And I remember him telling me, um, if you wake up tomorrow and, um, you want to do it again, that's a good sign. Hmm. And I woke up the next day. Well, first off, when I was done, um, I had one buddy go with me and, and when I was done, I, I, I got off stage and I, I had to leave because I was so, you know, I've done a lot of things in my life, but there was nothing that compared to that feeling of, of being on stage and, and getting people to laugh and, uh, mm-hmm. from stuff that I just made up in my head, you know, it, it, out of thin air that it was kind of cool that there was these, that's the creative side is that there's an infinite possibilities of words that you can say and, and things you can do. And you just got to pick the ones that make people laugh and, and, it was five minutes I was up there and, and I, I was done and I said, we got to go. And I walked across the street to the parking lot and I fell on the ground <laughs> and I just had this smile on my face and he, my buddy was with me and he just, he's not highly sensitive and he just kind of was like, let's go, man. And I said, no, like, just give me a minute. And I couldn't get up. I was so happy. It was the greatest feeling I think I've ever felt. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. And then cut to, let's say a month later, <laughs> um, my, my favorite thing is that it was the ups and downs of it and the fact that if you're going to keep doing it, you have to, you know, it, it's, if you've been on stage 10 times, that's nothing. It's, it's the same, like in dog years, you know, they say it's like time seven. Mm-hmm. If you've been on stage eight times, it's just like you've been alive for eight days. That's as good at comedy as you are. Even though you have some ups and downs, you really are, are really new at it. And so I remember it, it, there's these, the thing, comedy can be so dark and, mm-hmm. uh, it could be so bright, but it can also be so dark and you got to kind of deal with it. And, um, these comedians are, a lot of them are very, very highly sensitive. And so my favorite comedian of all time, Norm MacDonald, hmm. Saturday Night Live and everything, he is incredibly sensitive. And to the point where he was, he was, he's an introvert and he said when he was young, he couldn't talk because he was just so, so shy. And mm-hmm. eventually he, something happened one day and something snapped in him and he couldn't stop laughing. And then he, he got into comedy. So I was looking for open mics in the Bay Area uh, where I live. And there was one for this place called the the Caravan Lounge. And they call it the Comedy Caravan. And it was like an 8 p.m. show. And you just had to come sign up. I thought, great. And so I went down there. And there were two friends of mine who wanted to see me do it. They had heard that I had started doing it. And so there were these two girls that, I, that were friends of mine. And I said, sure, come on down. I'm going to start here. So... I didn't see them. I went early and I signed up and I sat there nervous at, and I had a, a you know a beer or two at the bar and I walked outside and I just was walking around and it was just so, so incredibly nerve-wracking for me. Mm-hmm. And so my brain, I am hyper-tuned to everything in the room and mm-hmm. they call my name to get on stage uh, after a while. There's, let me just say this first, there was like seven people there. Uh, the host, a few other comics, like two other people in the audience and then a dude in a wheelchair that was really drunk and maybe like the bartender and sounds like a movie yeah it, it, yeah and so i was just <laughs> like well it shouldn't be a problem right? i just go up there and say things and then get off and it doesn't really matter what happened but uh the whole situation was just uh a little too much for me and so i <laughs> i'm outside freaking out and all of a sudden i hear all right, guys, give it to put your hands together for Johnny Martinez. And I'm like, oh, crap. So I'm not even thinking about anything but uh, how ridiculous this is. So I run inside. Uh, my jacket was hanging on a, st- a bar stool. I reached inside to get my notes, and it took me a long time. And the host sat there with the mic staring at me, and everybody else was staring at me while I was fumbling through my notes. And there were a bunch of pieces of paper in there. They fell on the ground. Oh, I picked him up, shuffled him, and, and, and then ran on stage, shook his hand, and he wasn't ready to shake my hand, so he kind of like walked <laughs> past me. I go, okay. I grab the mic, and I t- let the audience know that um, I was ready to go, and, and here we go. And I say my first joke. I don't I'm sorry. It was, it was something stupid, you know, like something about, oh, like, I don't know, my jokes are all stupid, but it's something, you know, about, <laughs> oh, when you just get started, you know, you don't have any point of view so it's just all about like look at me i'm 
my, my name is Martinez, but look how I don't look like a Martinez, right? You know, and it was something like, uh-huh. I'm like Taco Bell. I'm not, I'm a non-authentic Mexican. Uh, <laughs> if something's so stupid, you know, and, and so uh, I say it and just nothing. And then the guy in the front with the wheelchair just starts yelling at me oh, <laughs> and wow. s- starts heckling me. And he's drunk. <laughs> I realize like, okay. Like I'm gonna, I I don't know what's going on, but so there's something happening to me, and I realized that I started sweating, and I started my vision started to go black. Oh no! I feel like I'm getting anxiety just listening to this. <laughs> and it's all right because there's a great finish. But uh, my vision starts to go black. I start sweating, and it was the worst feeling I could remember having. And I realized that I am in the middle of a full-blown panic attack on stage at the Caravan Lounge in San Jose, California, uh, in a dark lit. Uh, bar with like a few people and they're all just staring at me blankly and the guy in the wheelchair even has his mouth open staring at me and so then I look down at my notes and then I look up and I see my two friends just started to walk in in the middle of this happening so they come to see uh, me do comedy for the first time what they see is is a guy in a wheelchair and a bunch of people uh, and just the, the guy in the wheelchair was standing and is sitting in the front right in front of me and everybody else was in the back and they just see me in the middle of a panic attack and they're like okay and they sit down in the corner and I see them and then it throws me off even more and it puts the panic attack to another level oh. and <laughs> I looked down at my notes and I had a joke about LeBron James in the Kia commercials just the hackiest worst joke and I remember the note just said LeBron James in Ikea and so I looked up at the crowd and I just went LeBron James in Ikea and then the guy in the back goes tell me what about LeBron James in Ikea and I just went there's something funny about that and then I just looked down the guy in the wheelchair started yelling at me again and then he got quiet and then I realized I cannot be on stage right now yeah and I just went, I'm done. And I put the mic in the mic stand, and the host was outside smoking a cigarette. And so he hears, I'm done, and he can, he's confused. So he just runs inside. <laughs> and he didn't see what had just happened, so he just assumes that I did fine. So he runs in and starts clapping his hands <laughs> above his head, and he goes, give it up, everybody, for Johnny Martinez. And I walk by him about to faint, and I sit down, and my friends are there, and they're like, are you okay? And I just I, I walked past him and uh, went outside and, and shook for about 20 minutes and tried to get myself back together. So, Oh, my God. How long were you on stage, like that whole time, do you think? Oh, I think it was about two minutes. But it probably felt like forever. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I, I realized, I said, I need to get off stage. So it took me, I took two weeks off, of that and then I, I went back up on stage uh, at the first place I'd ever done comedy at this cafe and it went well and I said okay I'm good but it was really really hard to get up there and so you know one of the things that I find with myself being being highly sensitive and this is one thing when I was young I always said maybe I'm like autistic or something which was these places in my mind where I cannot it's hard for me to go back to that bar because even get, approaching that bar brings up these strong feelings. Mm-hmm. And so there are certain places in my mind, like even if I'm looking to move to a new place, I need to go there and fill it out because I, even, the, even the street or the area might give me a really weird feeling and I, and I can't explain, but I feel like I just can't live here. And I went back to that first place I did comedy because it went well. And in my mind, it was a comforting, almost like motherly thing where it was just really nurturing and I felt comfortable. And... I think in my life, a lot of times I am looking for that motherly nurturing kind of thing to mm-hmm. feel comfortable or else these these feelings kind of come up and I, I need to kind of quell them, you know, that anxiety. And that's mm-hmm. kind of the source for a lot of anxiety. So, Have you ever gone back to that place where you had the anxiety attack? I haven't yet, but I would, eventually I will. That is intense. I feel like I was going through it with you. Yeah, it was. <laughs> it's a funny story to me because of the fact that when, when the I was just happy that the the host came in clapping his hands because at least it makes it funny at the end. Uh, yeah, it was really funny that when he did that because everybody was just staring at me. So, do you think that being funny and being a comedian is like a coping mechanism? That's probably at the root of my coping mechanism as a male extroverted HSP Mm -hmm. is being funny because being funny is an amazing way to uh, get rid of the anxiety that bubbles up with Mm -hmm. 
being out on the outside of the bell curve. So, yeah. Wow. That's fascinating. And I wonder how many other comedians have used comedy as a way to deal with something else. Yeah. It's, it's, I, I, when I was young, it was a way to not get in fights. Um, right. It was a way to get accepted or approval. Yeah. I, I was, I was, uh, yeah, yeah. It was, it was a very, very, uh, good skill to have and yeah. um, th- th- huh. develop. It got me through things and um, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not. You know, if I use it, if I yeah. were to use it as a career, you know, I'm a, that's another thing is I'm a software engineer. It's, that's a very mm-hmm. weird thing to be doing comedy and in software engineering. <laughs> and so uh, that alone is absurd. And so, you know, that's like Al and I on, on the podcast we talk about because he's, I'm, I'm an extroverted engineer and he's an introverted tutor psychologist <laughs> where he has to deal with people constantly. And mm-hmm. it, you know, we both do have jobs that, uh, that in a personality and you know, our vertedness, dra- our jobs drain us and mm-hmm. we have to recharge our batteries outside of our work. And it, maybe it would be nice to have a job or a career where um, it was charging for us and maybe we'd look forward to a little bit more. Right. And I actually wanted to ask you a little bit more about being a software engineer. How do you feel like being a HSP and an extrovert have affected your performance on the job and just how much you like or don't like your job and what you do? I got into engineering because my, I, I was, when I was a kid, I was uh, going back. We, we, um, my, my mom wrote an article when I was young and, um, I'll, I'll connect this some way. I, I just kept jumping back like 10 years. And then finally I just said, when I was born, no, <laughs> I, when I was young, my mom wrote an article, I think I was five or six years old called occupying Johnny's time. And huh. she wrote in there that it was a lot of tongue in cheek stuff about how I was, I constantly needed attention and I was a handful and she didn't really want to deal with it. Oh. And so it was funny. I find it oh, funny. Okay. Some people don't find it funny, but I find it really funny. So, uh, but one of it, she says, I didn't realize that my son is an extrovert in every sense of the word. Uh, but she also said that there was a point, and then I talked to her about it later. She also said that there was a point, like I, I would come home from school and I would uh, already have the phone in my hand, holding it up to my mom saying, so-and-so's mom is on the phone. Uh, like I was, I'd already set it up to him for him to come over that day. And I didn't spend more than 10 seconds to make it happen. Uh, but she said that once the person was there, that there was a moment when I would all of a sudden decide I am done and I need to be alone. And so a lot of extroverted uh, people, they just don't have that moment. They they like their alone time, but they don't need it. And I do need it. Um, and she, I, that was since I was a little kid. And so I was always, my alone time was precious to me, but I, I needed to be outgoing. And so I made this weird, tough decision at some point uh, to be an engineer because of the fact that I could not ignore my, when I was alone, I loved doing this stuff and I loved learning about it. Um, what I was not, aware of was that that was a temporary thing where that that time was shorter than the time that I needed to go explore and do other stuff with other people and extrovert. And so I made the tough decision to be uh, an engineer because uh, it was in me. My brain's wired that way. I was always really good at math and science. It came supernatural to me. I was very, it was a way for me to be creative because software, although it's algorithmically based, it's, um, there is a lot of creativity. You can solve problems in a bunch of different ways, and you can it's super powerful. You can, you can change the world with software. Um, a lot of my family were physicists and engineers, and I just I couldn't it was like this thing that I couldn't ignore inside of me, so I did it. Um, and what I found was I loved doing it, but I quickly kind of got sick of it. And so once I got my first job, uh, it was within two or three weeks, I realized, okay this is very, very, very draining on me and um, this is tough. And I find myself being more charismatic around the office and doing a lot of talking to people, almost like in a political way. And I was like, I I didn't really know what was going on other than um, I I was, uh, I needed to be, I needed to be an extrovert. I needed an outlet. And so while I was at work, eight hours a day was way too much for me to be doing this. And so what I've done recently is I basically wire my job for um, having more of an extroverted role or else I kind of need to, I kind of panic a little bit. And what about being highly sensitive? Do you think that helps you at all in being a software engineer? That's a really good question. What? It, well, okay. First off, what it helps me do is it helps me get a job because, um, you know, as, as uh, highly sensitive people, we have this strong 
uh, intuition about our kind of surroundings, I think. And as an extrovert, I really, really have that. I I noticed that when I was young that um, just situations I could kind of read people and what I can do is, uh, and this is kind of a tangent on your question, but um, b- basically when I talk to people, I get a really good feeling about them really fast. And not that I can read their mind, but I can definitely either jump onto whatever frequency they're ticking on or I can kind of have them shift to mine and I can tune in with them and have a real connection with them really fast. And so what I found was um, that I could get jobs very easily because I could annihilate interviews. Um, wow. And so being an extrovert, I could talk to people. And my, my first interview, I was not qualified for it, but there was I spoke with two engineers, and I the first one uh, I talked to within a couple minutes, we were talking about I had shifted the conversation somehow to uh, not on purpose. It just we just got into a conversation, and I'd shifted it to talking about uh, investing in something else that this guy was doing. And then the other guy, I he started just opening up to me and yelling about something that he was mad about in Silicon Valley or something like that. And he felt they felt really comfortable. And the reason that happened is because I was so anxious about this interview, which I I became so attuned to what was going on and and trying to connect with these guys, and it really really worked. And I ended up getting the job, and I did it a decent job but it was really draining on to me and yeah and then the next job i had it was the same thing you know part part of being a software engineer sometimes you don't have a clear picture of exactly what needs to be done um which is frustrating and most engineers that are not sensitive they thrive when there's a clear path of what to do in my job uh, i'm designing a product where there's not a clear path and we kind of have to make a general purpose product and so my sensitivity gives me a really really good intuition on mm-hmm. on what uh, the best direction would be when there's not a clear direction because I could kind of read what's going on around and kind of make a best decision and maybe a broad decision that'll that, but push in the right direction. Uh, and so I think that, that the, the intuition that I have as a highly sensitive person uh, has definitely helped me with that. And so, but in general, um, you know, we talked earlier about when you're a highly sensitive person, especially an extra, you kind of need to, have a cause because you 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 feel strongly about certain things and then you I think that the skill set is is for pushing something and so for me uh, I, I I recently had a have a uh, job interview for a new job I might actually be switching jobs so that's doing a lot of travel might be living in uh, Belgium for a couple months out of the year um, this and that and it's going to be people based and and I think that it's really for me a shift uh, to the right kind of on point for what my skill set is and I think that that's that's huge in, in in personal development, especially if you're a sensitive person. Is you don't want to be constantly uh, stressing yourself uh, uh, with something that's you. You kind of need to figure out uh, places where you're not stressed and where you're comfortable. And I think it's really, really, really important, especially yeah. if something as big as a career. Right, and that's def- the number one thing people want to know about when they learn about high sensitivity is what job or career or work can I do that will make me happy and will make me miserable. And that was so fascinating what you said about interviews because I've always posited that I hate interviews and I do very poorly at them. Yeah. Um, But that might maybe just because I'm nervous and anxious and don't have like enough confidence or something. But you make such a good point about that as an HSP, I should be able to really kind of read the interviewer. Um, But in a way, I think I do read the interviewer, but I do it too negatively. Like, oh, they're not going to like me. Oh, yeah. Something like that. I, I, I noticed that my, my best friend is an extrovert. If you're an introverted HSP, I highly recommend finding a good friend who is an extroverted HSP. If you're an extroverted HSP, find a good friend who's an introverted HSP. I think it's really, really good pairing because, you know, naturally. Um, so before we started this interview, I actually had to stop by the store. And as I was checking out, I noticed that the the, the checkout clerk, uh she she was uh, checking me out, and I noticed when I first walked up, she had she put her head down, and I could you could within ten seconds I could tell this person was very very introverted, and then like fifteen seconds after that, I could tell oh I, this is a highly sensitive person. You could just mm-hmm. tell by the way that they were moving, and and you could just see it. You know, you could almost kind of read it the way they were not just shy, but but uh, you could just kind of see it. And I had this connection to her, and I started talking. And as soon as I started talking, she opened up, and she started talking back, and there was this quick, like, lock of, of something that we would 
probably get along. And I realized that, that uh, you know, my best friend of, of years is an introverted HSP. And we have always felt, I, I think that, that I, my mom told me this too when, when I was talking about this, is that I never had a lot of close, close friends. Mm-hmm. Um, you don't necessarily want to let people in because you are you know what's underneath it all and you kind of feel comfortable keeping a little bit of a distance. But having that that person that is close and you feel comfortable with because that, that maybe understands you and, and is such a, such a value, it's worth as much as anything. Yeah. Um, because, you know, that's... We, we can be so insecure as HSPs and, and we don't really know why, but we know that when we find somebody else in a similar way, when we can open up to them, it's like, it's so nice to have another human being that we can go to. And I just, I find that, that the naturally, you know, the introverts and the extroverts go together well. Uh, and introvert HSPs and extrovert HSPs, there's an extra dimension of compatibility there that's that's really beautiful and, and it's nice to have. So, hmm. uh, yeah, that that's my little theory i don't know if it's right but uh i just know in my experience that that's that's been uh that's been true for me that i've had fulfilling relationships not very many but with people that are on the opposite end of the spectrum yeah well that makes sense to me so you're talking about how being highly sensitive has been a benefit as a software engineer and in job interviews i was wondering if you could chat a little bit more about other parts other aspects of your life in which you think being highly sensitive is a benefit when you look at the bright sides about it, that we are um, we are in a minority in the population, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. It, it, being highly sensitive is is not a hindrance. I think it's a it's a nice gift because what I find is that one of the great benefits in general, in the big picture of being highly sensitive, is the insightfulness that you get because of your enhanced intuition. And so I find that when people look at something, and I think that's another reason why comedians are highly sensitive is because you have to take something that everybody's looking at and you have to find what's different about it. And then you have to not as a comedian, you have to find a way to deliver it to the turn it like around to the people that are looking at it and say, Hey, did you notice this in a way that makes them laugh? But in general, you have a keen ability to see things in a different way and in a, in a in a unique perspective, and I think that that um, that is something that you need to that that what I found is that uh, it's it's helped me in my life kind of push myself in the right direction and um, the the insightfulness and stuff. What it helps me with is like for instance when when what I found what I talked about is that people initially when I was younger, I, I kind of opened my mind up by talking to people that were older than me and talking to people that had a lot more experience in, in things than I did and, and different things. And as you, as you start to learn about them, you have these great conversations and you're just, you kind of clear things up and you, your mind opens up when you're young, you have, you know, your family and then you get older and you have your school and then your hobbies and everything. And your, your mind kind of expands and expands. And eventually, you know, you get to the point you might be thinking about the universe and this and that. And, and you get to a point where it's like almost too much. And especially for an HSP, you go, okay, I, I don't know what the answer to all this is, but I need to, I need to kind of stop and relax. And, and, um, and what you've done is you've given yourself a great perspective on life that non-HSPs might not have a different, a different view on things. And so what I found is that as I've gotten older is that people, once where I went to people for answers, is that people will naturally come to me for advice on things because – I typically can can provide them a unique perspective by listening to their problem, and I feel like I can kind of tune in and have a nice intuitive understanding of their problem. And so, um, that that's something that I think that highly sensitive people really have as a gift, and and I think that it's um, it's a great thing. And so, how you put that to work in life um, is is uh, is up to you. You know, introverts and extroverts differ, and so I'm an extrovert, and so. What I what what typically is um, there's you know some people are master of one trade and other people are uh, jack of all trades and I'm kind of more of a uh, a jack of all trade I'm not I don't go too deep into things I don't have like a super I'm super passionate about like the guitar that I need to play it all the time I wish I did but I don't I kind of like do learn a little bit about a lot of different things and so if I was an introvert introverts like to go deep into something they really like the depth of something you know the scientists are introverts typically because they like to really study something and really understand it and for me I, I can't do that I, I wish I could but I can and so I think as an introvert HSP that insightfulness will help you 
if you really want to dig into something, you can really dig into it and from a unique perspective, and, and you'll find that uh, the your heightened intuition and awareness of stuff will give you an edge in that. For me, it's an edge in, like I talked about, is kind of a general big picture thing of, of fighting for and getting people more excited about some sort of cause or some sort of, in uh, this kind of thing is kind of a, an under. What I like is helping people kind of understand themselves and discover themselves, and 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 help them along because as we do that, that journey that we're on, uh, there's roadblocks in the way, and you know it's nice to have somebody with experience that can guide you around these roadblocks so that you can get there wherever you're going faster. Mm-hmm. Lovely. That was a wonderful <laughs> description <laughs> of the benefits of high sensitivity. So the last thing I wanted to ask you before we wrap up is about self-care. What do you do when you're having, uh, when you're struggling, when you're feeling down? Are we thinking about the universe a little too much? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I've been there, yeah. <laughs> to care for yourself. Yeah. Well, I, I find that, you know, especially when, you, when you're highly sensitive, you find that I think that uh, other people's problems get put on. You, you can't help but they, they, you get stuck with them whether you want to or not they kind of become your problems too and they're in your head and what that is is a stressor and anxiety you know there's certain things for me i i think of i break things into uh my environment my brain and my body and i need to uh keep my body healthy by uh having a good diet and um and being in shape i need to keep my mind healthy by getting rid of that in- the stressors and anxieties in my life and i do that partially by you know my internal thoughts i need to control those but also my external is my environment and that's a big stressor too and so you know if i have a schedule of going to the gym or doing yoga you know we are our bodies need that and so um whatever it is and so it's a great way if you have headphones in your ears to just work out and in a way meditate it's it's a time for you to take all that energy and, and get rid of it in some way and so yoga is another way is, is, is meditation i got really big into that um because what it is is a clearing of your mind and so you're not letting all that in um the other thing you know diet is a big one because um the stomach aches that a lot of highly sensitive people have from just too much thinking and, and too much stimulation. It's weird that just the environment can can have a role in our physical health. And so, um, one way to do it is making sure and planning out. You know, it comes from preparation and planning because um, you need to kind of organize things. Because the the overwhelming of stuff, I find that when I just clean up and organize myself and my diet and everything, it it helps me a lot. And then with environment, um, you know, we. We can't help like I, I the joke is with uh, like with Al I was talking about he, Al had um, my co-host on the podcast he had uh, kidney stones and as an HSP that's like a nightmare of mine because I know how painful it can be and so I went over there and I talked to him and he's like yeah I got kidney stones in and I, after he started talking about it you know he's he's so not not sensitive <laughs> and within about a minute or so I realized oh I feel kind of queasy and um, I kind of like laid on the ground and I, the joke is that like when he told me about kidney stones I told him like Al do you realize it's really really hard for me to know that you have kidney stones <laughs> and, and he's like yeah and, and then so within a minute do you apologize <laughs> yeah he did apologize and then within a minute I'm laying on the ground and he's like are you okay I'm like yeah just the fact that you have kidney stones is really hard for me right now <laughs> and uh, that kind of sums it up right so we're so we we really really need to make an effort to stop and think okay where are the stressors in my life and what can i do to control them you know there's sometimes there's toxic people in your life and th- we are really bad with that especially the the ones that deal with codependency where um maybe we have something a hole in us that's that's trying to be filled and and we've tried to fill it with certain people and they can you know these toxic people in our life we need to really make an effort to get rid of them and try to surround ourselves with people that make us feel good. And, and um, sometimes you don't realize it, but when you cut that out, you know, you can, like there's a growth on us. We need to cut out this weird growth. If I had something growing on my knee, I need to cut that out just like in the same way. I need to cut out that toxic person that, that I've been hanging out with or the relationships we have and um, really focus on yourself. And And so I find that it's kind of a whole mind, body, and, and environment, kind of a design that I have to constantly keep up because we, the stress is going to stress in our, and for highly sensitive people is big and it's going to 
uh, shorten our lives and everything, but we can we can take care of that and be super super happy and fulfilled, and find that like I said, being highly sensitive is is really a blessing if we use it right. Well, Johnny, thank you so much for being here and for sharing your story about your very interesting life as a comedian and a yeah. software engineer and as an extrovert, highly sensitive man. Thank yeah. you. Kelly, thank you so much for having me. That's it, folks. I want to thank Johnny Martinez again for sharing his experiences on the show. You can find Johnny and his podcast, The Introvert Extrovert Podcast, at introextropod.com and on Twitter by the name IntroExtroPod. I'll have links to all of those resources in the show notes at highlysensitiveperson.net slash episode 60, 60. Sign up for my twice monthly newsletter for updates on new podcast episodes, blog posts, and curated interesting HSP news from around the web at highlysensitiveperson.net. If you enjoy this podcast and would like to support it somehow, then please become a patron. Go to patreon.com slash HSP. You can support the show by giving a donation in any amount per episode. Even $1 is great, trust me. That's Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash HSP. And if you can't afford to support the show financially, please show your support by rating it on iTunes. Thank you so much for listening. I'm telling you, there you come on, you can do one HSP joke, like a, even if it's a cheesy, like a hacky joke. Like, why I, did the HSP cross the road? Because, um, uh, yeah, the HSP crossed the road because, um, I don't know, they were, they were, I don't know. <laughs> well, okay, this will be easier. Why did the introvert cross the road? Because there were a bunch of extroverts on that side and they want to get to the other side. I don't know. Or there were just a lot of people on that side. Yeah. Why did the, why did the skeleton, why didn't the skeleton cross the road? Why? It didn't have the guts. Oh. I heard that oh. when I was seven years old. It's one of my favorite jokes. Um, did you hear that the guy who invented throat lozenges died? Really? Yeah. Yeah. What? what? Is there a punchline <laughs> to that? Uh, yeah. All right. Go. Oh, oh, wait. Oh, he did. Oh, man. That's such a shame. How, what did he die of? Um, I don't know, but I, there was no coffin at the funeral. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>